So I was watching Dr. Phil the other day, and he did a show on the gender pronoun controversy. Now, I'm someone who loves to understand the arguments and try to give an honest evaluation of the situation. Now, this video is going to go over the history of the issue, the arguments presented by both sides, and I'm going to let you decide which side you find more convincing. Now, I'm going to have links and citations throughout this video if you want to go beyond this video and do a deep dive for yourself. So let's just jump into the issue. First, we have the LGBTQ plus activists who are arguing against what's known as biological determinism. Now, biological determinism reasons that human behavior is directly related to an individual's physiology. In this case, we're talking specifically about a person's biological sex. Activists argue that assigning mandatory gender pronouns based off biological sex is wrong and offensive. See, they reject the notion that biological sex determines social gender norms. They argue that pronouns such as he or she should be based on a person's psychological beliefs and not an objective biological evaluation of their sex organs. Now, this distinction between one's psychological beliefs and their biological reality is the difference between sex and gender. Now, here are the LGBTQ plus advocates on the Dr. Phil show explaining the differences between the psychologically based gender and the biologically based sex. How do you explain the difference between sex and gender? I consider sex to be uh, our biological makeup, our chromosomes, our hormones, our genitals as a biological makeup. But our gender is more of an internal sense. So think of it like this. Sex is what's between the legs and gender is what's between the ears, right? It's our, how we see ourselves on the inside. Now, this distinction between sex and gender started in the 1960s. See, before, gender was tied to sex. Biological men were assumed to have the psychological gender traits of masculinity, while biological females were presumed to have the psychological gender traits of femininity. Dr. Robert Stroller in 1968 began distinguishing between the terms sex and gender. See, Stroller wanted to explain the phenomenon of transsexuality, where a patient's biological sex and psychological gender didn't match. Now, Dr. Stroller would identify subjects based on biological sex and then describe the amount of femininity or masculinity each person would exhibit psychologically. Now, Stroller did it in this way so he could explain why some people felt that they were trapped in the wrong body, which he called transsexuality. Now, by separating both sex and gender, it allowed Stroller to better express the phenomenon that he was investigating. Now, Stroller reasoned that gender was the social expectations of a society on a person's biological realities. Think about it this way, the way a man was expected to act versus the way a woman was expected to act. Now, if we fast forward to the 1970s, prominent feminist Dr. Gail Rubin applied this concept of sex and gender to feminism. Dr. Gail wrote, so feminism should aim to create a genderless, though not sexless, society in which one's sexual anatomy is irrelevant to who one is, what one does, and with whom one makes love. Now, 20 years later, Dr. Linda Nicholson, in her 1994 paper, Interpreting Gender, calls this the coat rack view of gender. She reasons that our biological bodies are like coat racks, and they provide the site to which gender is constructed. See, they argue that gender should be looked at as a spectrum from masculinity to femininity and it's superimposed on the coat rack of a person's biological body. So the reality is, a person's sex is determined by their genes and hormones and so forth, but their gender is something that they put on to express that gender identity. So you can have the situation where you have a biological male present as extremely masculine to extremely feminine, or anywhere in between, a spectrum. Now, it's important to note that each society imposes on the biological sexes their cultural expectations of how both males and females should behave psychologically. You may have heard the phrases, be a man or woman's work. See, the modern feminist movement promoted this view of a genderless society to empower women. See, in the 1960s, the cultural norms were that women stayed at home, cooked, and raised children. And these gender norms were based solely on biological sex woman's work. But by separating the biological aspect of being a woman from the cultural aspect of acting like a woman, 
women would be empowered to go into roles traditionally held by men because they were seen as more masculine. So modern feminism believed that by removing that psychological stigma, women would be empowered to work in fields traditionally dominated by men. Now, today, the modern LGBTQ plus movement has taken that work started by the modern feminist movement and incorporated it into their struggle. But they made one major change. See, the feminist movement specifically worked toward a genderless society, but not a sexless society. See, the feminist movement embraced biological sex as part of the movement and celebrated it. Now, in contrast, the LGBT plus Q movement promotes both a genderless and sexless society. Advocates argue that biological sex associations with words like woman and man should be changed into arbitrary labels based on an individual's personal view of what they believe a woman and man is. Take the word woman, for instance. It's defined in terms of biological sex and gender. But LGBTQ plus advocates promote both a sexless and genderless society, so the word woman is undefinable in that view. This is why LGBTQ plus advocates, when asked to define what a woman or man is, they can't. Check it out. Can even tell you what these words mean. Like, what is a woman? Well, can you tell me what a woman is? No, I can't. Because but, it's not for me to say. I, womanhood looks different for everybody. What do, you, what do you define a woman as? An adult human female. And what does a female mean? Uh, well, well, that's how do you, how do you define a someone with, with female reproductive organs. Okay. You stood up here and said trans women are women. Yes. Tell me what you mean. What is a woman? Womanhood is something that, just as Ethan explained, I cannot define because I am not but myself. you used the word. So what did you mean when you said trans women are women if you don't know what it means? Right. So here's the thing. So I do not define what a woman is because I do not identify as a woman. Womanhood is something that is an umbrella term. It includes people that who... That describes what? People who identify as a woman. Now, the issue with this line of reasoning is clear. If the word can mean anything, then it essentially means nothing. Let me give you an example. If I say that the bungo friendly is the best thing in the world, your next question is, what's a bungo friendly? And if my response is this. No, I can't. Because but, it's not for me to say. I, that doesn't help the conversation in any meaningful way. You still don't know what I'm talking about. But instead, if I said, well, a bungle friendly is a car, we can now move the conversation forward with a common understanding of what we're talking about. Here's a picture of a bungle friendly. It's important to note, you didn't have to know what the car looked like to understand the concepts that we were talking about. So when LGBTQ plus advocates say that trans women are real women. And the thing is, is that we need to realize that trans women are women, trans men are men too. And they claim that the term woman is undefinable. Well, Can you tell me what a woman is? No, I can't. Because but, it's not for me to say. I, womanhood looks different for everybody. You stood up here and said trans women are women. Yes. Tell me what you mean. What is a woman? Womanhood is something that, just as Ethan explained, I cannot define because I am not but myself. you used the well, word. So what did you mean when you said trans women are women if you don't know what it means? Things, right? Then the statement that trans women are real women is essentially meaningless unless you can tell us what the noun woman means. And this also applies to pronouns like he or she that are equally undefined in this way of thinking. So let's move on to arguments against the LBGTQ position for a sexless and genderless society. Now, first, conservatives generally point to the fact that these words are defined and are not arbitrary. They reject the concept of a sexless society as anti-science and not based in reality. Let's first start with the pronouns. Traditionally, pronouns were assigned with biological sexes. For instance, he, him, his were all considered male pronouns, while she and her were considered female pronouns. Now, when we look up these words, it is clear that they refer to biological sex. Let's start with the word she. Here's a definition for the word she. Used to refer to a woman, girl, or female animal previously mentioned or easily identified. As a noun, it is a female a woman. Now, since the word she is defined in terms of woman or girl, let's look up the terms woman or girl. Dictionary woman, noun, an adult female human being. Now, since woman is defined as female, let's look up the word female. Dictionary, female, adjective, of or denoting the sex that can bear offspring or produce eggs. Distinguished biologically by the production of gametes, which can be fertilized by male gametes. 
So let's follow the chain of reasoning. The word she is defined in terms of the word woman or girl. The words woman and girl are defined in terms of female. And the term female is defined in terms of biological sex organs. So conservatives claim that these words are defined in terms of biological sex realities and not what a person feels about them mentally. And just arbitrarily stating that these words are undefinable is not the reality of the situation when these words are clearly defined. Essentially, you can't just make it up. Their second counter is that the argument regarding pronouns is simply a bait and switch. The argument is presented as one regarding pronouns, like he or she, but the words actually being changed are not pronouns at all. For instance, the word man and woman are noun. So saying that this is a pronoun debate is disingenuous when the words that are actually being changed are the definitions of what a man is and what a woman is. But this is about changing nouns, such as woman, and pronouns, such as she, and making them into arbitrary labels with no real meaning. And the overall goal in doing this is to create a genderless and sexless society, which even feminists don't agree with. And lastly, they make the point that psychological gender opinions should have no bearing on objective biological realities. Look at this exchange from the Dr. Phil show. Tell me you what want the to word reduce, means, though. So you that's want to the reduce problem. women, you want to reduce men down to maybe just their genetics, our genitals, no. our chromosomes, right? That's what you're what saying. You want to do is that's a, what, what, you, what you want to do is appropriate women. You want to appropriate womanhood okay. and turn it into basically a costume that could be worn. Now, it's interesting to note Matt Walsh's argument here is the same one used in 1994 by Dr. Linda Nicholson. Remember the analogy of biological sex being the coat rack and gender being the coat? And Matt Walsh is just taking that analogy and using the word costume instead of coat. So in conclusion, LGBTQ plus advocates argue that, one, biological determinism is wrong. Our society should be both genderless and sexless. Pronouns like he or she should be treated like names. When you meet someone, you just don't assign them a name. You ask them what their name is. And this should also be done for gender pronouns. They also argue that terms like women and men should not be defined at all. Each individual should determine what that term means for them. And that biological realities should have no bearing on what a woman or man is. It is up to the individual to judge and not the society. And lastly, they claim the reason why we should adopt this way of thinking is because the psychological harm of telling someone that they are not a real man or a real woman has lasting effects. Like when blacks and Jews were told that they were not human. It is worth the effort to include everyone without making anyone seem less than others. Trans women are real women. Trans men are real men. Even though the term women and man are undefined. Now, conservatives counter those points. They say, first, this is about objective reality versus your psychological preference. Biological sex is objective, an objective fact, and is not up to interpretation. Words like woman and man describe the biological realities and have always been defined in those terms. And as shown earlier, pronouns like he or she are logically chained to these biological realities and not to anyone's individual psychological preference. Imagine someone being born white and demanding to be identified as a black person because they psychologically feel that way. They also claim that this is simply a bait and switch. They claim that this is not about pronouns, this is about nouns like man and woman and that LGBTQ plus advocates are trying to deceptively change these words so they have no meanings. Now, conservatives also accept the fact that we live in a free society and we can request to be called anything we want within reason. But when you start using terms in contradictory ways, it becomes confusing and arbitrary to everyone. And lastly, they accept the distinction between sex and gender, but reject the notion that society should be sexless. So at the end of the day, these are the arguments. I know some people are going to be upset about arguments on one side or the other side, but these are just the facts that I found in my research and later. And I hope you appreciate an honest review of the situation and me trying to kind of sift out all the noise. But the question at the end of the day is, what side do you agree with? Who do you think has the better argument? Let me know in the comments below because I'm really interested to see if anybody's opinions change or, if, or has it hardened your position at the end of the day, this video was meant to spark conversation 
and open our minds to both sides of the argument. And hopefully it did that for you. My name is Nate the Lawyer, and I'll see you next time. Peace.